Every urban center has its monuments, its history, its skyline. But great cities are more than buildings. Great cities have a pulse. And few megacities capture the complexity, chaos, and vitality of a living system more vividly than New York. Yet, for a place so deeply embedded in American culture, its fascinating origins often go overlooked. After all, no city becomes the celebrity's playground, the city that never sleeps, the melting pot, the mother of exiles, and the American dream overnight. While it is no longer the largest metropolis on Earth, it is still the most influential. But as this fast-paced, capitalist mecca matures, it's confronting a unique set of challenges. Let's take a bite out of the Big Apple, America's megacity. One of the most remarkable things about this concrete jungle is how quickly it sprouted up. Compared to the other two megacities we've profiled so far, New York is relatively young. Less than 400 years ago, the city looked like this. In 1609, the island of Manhattan was found by an expedition. Its leader, Henry Hudson, realized immediately that it was a geographical gem, the ideal location to build a city. A large river ran along its entire western shore, and on its eastern edge was a narrow estuary connected to a large bay. Its southern tip was flanked by two more large bays and dozens of islands, including the much larger Long Island, which shields Manhattan from ocean storms. And, as we saw in our previous explorations of Mexico City and Bangladesh, containing and distributing clean water to residents is often a keystone challenge for dense urban centers. On this front, however, New York City reaps the benefits of nature. Direct contact with water ensures reliable access, while elevated terrain spares it from excessive flooding. But back to the 17th century. After word reached Europe that Hudson had discovered what he called as pleasant a land as one can tread upon, the mercantilist-minded Dutch sent 30 families to build a settlement called New Amsterdam. In exchange for some metal kettles, axes, and cloth, the Native Americans who hunted throughout the area gave the Dutch the island. Slaves were immediately brought in to begin building the town. The town's population reached 700 in 1664, but it still wasn't receiving very much support from the crown back in Holland, so English King Charles II swooped in and, with four warships, captured the town without resistance. He then gave the colony to his brother, the Duke of York, and you can guess what they called it. By the end of the 18th century, New York had become an important port city. Then came the revolution that changed everything. In 1776, New York joined the other American colonies and declared independence from the English. After getting kicked out of Boston, the British responded by sending an entire fleet of redcoats to seize and occupy New York, which they held for seven years until George Washington led his victorious rebel army back into the city. After the war, New York briefly served as the capital of the newly formed United States until the federal government moved to the more centrally located District of Columbia. It's fascinating how that came about. The decision was ultimately up to President Washington, but he left it up to his two right-hand men to figure out. In a backroom deal, brokered by James Madison over dinner, Treasury Secretary Alexander Hamilton of New York agreed to allow the nation's capital to move south to Northern Virginia, the home state of Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson. In exchange, Jefferson agreed to support Hamilton's financial plan, which included the creation of a powerful central bank. Soon after, the New York Stock Exchange was established, laying the groundwork for Lower Manhattan to become the financial capital of the world. Today, it's home to the two largest stock exchanges by total market capitalization. A couple more events in the early 1800s helped accelerate the city's growth. A grid pattern of streets was laid out, providing an organized plan of expansion to the north, and the opening of the Erie Canal in 1825. This increased New York's importance as an export center of goods, agricultural products, and raw materials that could now be easily transported from the resource-rich Great Lakes region. Around this time, the city became the gateway to America, as large numbers of German and Irish immigrants arrived. Between 1820 and 1850, New York's population quadrupled. Many of these newcomers had to settle in tenement houses without proper sanitation or clean water. Diseases like cholera, typhoid, and smallpox became rampant. The construction of the Croton Aqueduct, one of the world's first great modern water distribution systems, helped to solve this problem and hygiene began to immediately improve. In order to preserve the fast-growing city's connection to the environment, a 600-acre area of swampland and squatter's shacks was set aside for preservation. 
and eventually transformed into Central Park. Today, it's the most visited urban park in the country. Heading into the 1860s, slavery was deeply dividing the northern and southern states. New York was the epicenter of the abolition movement. When the Civil War began in 1861, after Abraham Lincoln was elected president, a riot broke out as angry white mobs attacked blacks who they blamed for low wages and the war. Hundreds were killed. Despite the unrest, the city's economic engine roared as it became the vital source of financing and supplies for the two million soldier strong Union war effort. After the Northern victory brought peace to the country, New York's industrialists were free to focus on building. In 1883, the Brooklyn Bridge was completed, linking New York to the third largest city in the country. The 1880s also brought electricity to the city, and by 1893, there were 1,500 arc lamps illuminating New York streets. In 1898, the state legislature incorporated Manhattan and the surrounding four boroughs of Brooklyn, Queens, the Bronx, and Staten Island into the city of New York instantly doubling its population and quadrupling its land area. After leading the earlier fight to abolish slavery, New York was now the leader of the women's suffrage and workers' rights movements. This culture of inclusivity also welcomed African Americans, fleeing the destruction and segregation of the South. They largely settled in an area on the Upper West Side that became known as Harlem, the cultural capital of Black America. Electricity made the city the center of nightlife in the Roaring Twenties. By the end of the decade, the New York metropolitan area's population had grown to 8 million, passing London to become the planet's largest urban area. In 1931, the city also had the world's tallest building, as the Empire State Building rose to dominate the skyline in an almost ridiculous way. World War II brought another wave of immigrants, fleeing the chaos and destruction in Europe. When it was over, New York's status as the unofficial capital of the world was cemented with the construction of the gleaming United Nations complex along the East River. Throughout its history, New York has also been a core force behind major social movements that have focused the country's vision while unifying New Yorkers as a community with a common identity. The city played an important role in the civil rights movement in the 1960s, as leaders like Dr. Martin Luther King rallied support through the New York-based news media. The gay rights movement counts Greenwich Village as its epicenter. This neighborhood was also the site of a crucial battle between the powerful developer Robert Moses and residents led by activist and author Jane Jacobs. Their grassroots movement ultimately blocked Moses from carrying out a project that would have bulldozed the village and the area now known as Soho in order to cut through the heart of Manhattan with a giant expressway. The Lower Manhattan Expressway was to have connected the Holland Tunnel with the Williamsburg and Manhattan bridges. It would have destroyed most of Soho. We would have lost one of the greatest inventories of 19th century buildings, not just in New York, but in the world. The highways, of course, destroyed the neighborhoods that they went through. Where was this going to end? The whole place was going to be laced with highways. What would we have left of Manhattan? I mean, Moses thought he was improving the city by bringing it up to date, by making it work for the automobile. And as it became clear that urban highways were in fact uh, profoundly destructive, it really became a battle between opposing forces. In the 1970s and 80s, economic problems and the crack cocaine epidemic created a spike in crime but modernized police strategies and the rebirth of Wall Street helped solve these challenges. Today, there are less than 400 murders a year in the city, down from a high of over 2,000 in 1990. Of course, New York still lives with the traumatic memory of its worst day, September 11, 2001, when more than 2,500 civilians and first responders died in the tragic attack on the World Trade Center. In the 16 years since, One World Trade Center has risen from the ashes to become the tallest building in the Western Hemisphere. Today, the New York metropolitan area has over 20 million residents. Just to be clear, the city of New York has about 8.5 million people. But for the purposes of this megacity series, I'm using entire metropolitan populations because that's a city's labor market, its economic zone if you will. Anyway. New York no longer is the largest city or metropolitan area in the world, but its still massive population 
presents tremendous challenges. For one, its subway is one of the busiest transportation systems on Earth. Its ridership nearly doubled from 1 billion annual riders in the 1990s to 1.8 billion today, but the amount of track and subway cars has stayed the same. This crowding has bogged things down. The system-wide average on-time rate has dropped from 90% over the last decade to just 65%. The silver lining is that a $17 billion Second Avenue subway line is coming online. The first phase opened this year, but the remaining three phases could take more than two decades to complete. Another issue is exorbitantly expensive housing. Costs in some high-end areas have been driven up by foreign investors, like wealthy Russians and Chinese, who like to park their fortunes in the ultra-secure New York real estate market. But the root cause of high prices is simple supply and demand. Whenever a new housing development is built with affordable units, it gets 10 times as many applicants as there are units available to rent. The mega developments Essex Crossing, Hunters Point South, and Pacific Park that are going up throughout the city are seeing this firsthand. In the near term, the high-end housing shortage will be eased, slightly, by the 28-acre Hudson Yards mega development. At an estimated total price tag of over $20 billion, this new neighborhood is the most expensive real estate project in American history. Another future mega project getting people's attention for different reasons is Cornell Tech on Roosevelt Island in the East River. The school joins the more than 120 colleges and universities in the city and will feature the world's first high-rise residential building that meets passive house energy efficient principles. Projects like these make it clear, New York City is cultivating the human capital needed to tackle the world's biggest problems. Thanks to climate change, New York will have its fair share. As we saw firsthand after Hurricane Sandy flooded large parts of the region, there is no bigger threat to New York City than rising seas. That storm caused nearly $20 billion in damages. With New York's coastline expected to be between 1 and 2 feet higher by 2050, now is the time to start planning for the future, whether that's designing flood and seawall solutions that blend with existing infrastructure, or embracing a policy known as managed retreat, where areas are simply abandoned in favor of higher ground. With so much at stake, there's little doubt New York City will meet these challenges. In many ways, it represents the best of our modern world. It's dynamic, creative, and socially tolerant. Its embrace of sustainability proves that capitalism and environmentalism are not incompatible, and its people, which speak 400 different languages and are 37% foreign-born, prove that, even in one of the most densely populated urban centers on the planet, if conditions are good, there's plenty of room for everyone to get along. Thanks for watching. I want to give a shout out to the Museum of New York whose video on the city's history really helped me out. I'm curious to know what you think it is about New York that most makes it what it is today, and what you think will be its biggest challenge in the future. If you like this video, subscribe and check back soon. We're headed to Cairo, Egypt next. For TDC, I'm Bryce Plank.